Scooby-Doo has been around forever. Starting back in 1969 with the original series Scooby-Doo Where Are You, it has since pretty much never gone away. You can go to any point in time and find an associated TV series. So in this past half century, there's been a ton of them. Reboots, sequels, prequels, shows that add new characters like Scrappy-Doo and Scooby-Dum, not making him up by the way, he's often forgotten. Along with straight-to-TV specials, straight-to-TV films, straight-to-home video and DVD movies, crossover movies, live-action movies, which I think includes the only entry in the franchise that's just named Scooby-Doo, and most recently a computer-animated movie simply named Scoob. With such longevity, it's now been around long enough for the entire existence of home video games. So it's no surprise that we start seeing Scooby-Doo games come along in the early 80s, and make their way onto numerous different systems. So I'm going to be looking at the games on PlayStation systems, of which there are seven altogether. And here's all of them. Can just about fit them all in one hand. Now, my main goal here, other than just playing them, I guess is to try and find which one... They're all going to fall, I'm going to put them down here. I'm going to try and find which one best represents the Scooby-Doo franchise as a whole. Now, when I think of Scooby-Doo video games, what I get in my mind and what I really want is something that involves collecting a lot of clues, solving a mystery, something that has a lot of adventure game elements, but also implements the kind of stealth and action you see in the show as well. I guess what I'm saying is I kind of see a Scooby-Doo game as a family-friendly version of something like Resident Evil. Um, something that's a little bit easier and less cryptic as well. You've got to remember, even though there's a lot of nostalgia in these and adults are going to be interested in Scooby-Doo, they are cartoons made for kids at the end of the day. You can't just go full Resident Evil and make something scary, cryptic and weird. But that's the kind of style I'd like to see explored. Now I'm just going to go through these in order of release date, which means we're going to be starting on the PlayStation 1 with Scooby-Doo and the Cyber Chase, which is also based on a movie. Released in 2001, published by THQ, and developed by Artco Limited, who I've not really heard of, but by looking at their Wikipedia page, they mostly make games based on kids' cartoons and that kind of thing. It is based on a Scooby-Doo movie of the same name, which I haven't seen, but I have read a plot summary, and by the looks of it, Scooby-Doo and the Cyber Chase involves the Scooby Gang being sucked into a digital video game world and having to play through video game levels themselves. So it should translate well to a video game. We've got a nice intro and theme song to start with. Classic stuff. It would have been disappointing to not see this. And the cutscene we start off with and cutscenes as a whole in this game are a pretty good representation of the cartoon. It looks and sounds like the cartoon just represented on a PlayStation 1 system. Jinkies! A phantom virus! Sounds like a job for Mystery Inc. But how are we going to capture the Phantom Virus, Fred? By splitting up. Daphne, you and I will go look for a trap. Thelma? The characters all act like you expect they would, and the voice acting is great, so I don't have any complaints when it comes to the general presentation prior to actually trying any gameplay. If you find the virus, get it to follow you back here so we can catch it. Hey, where are you guys going? Who? Us? Who? Us? Come on, guys. We can't do this without your help. <laughs> like, sure you can. Would you do it for a Scooby snack? No way. No way. Would you do it for two Scooby snacks? I've always wondered where they got their own brand of snacks from. Considering 90% of the time it's Velma offering them, I'm guessing it's her own recipe and she makes them. Otherwise, surely Shaggy and Scooby could just go buy their own and wouldn't have to be bribed to do anything then. The game's one player, and I bring this up now because it actually criticises itself for being one player. Oh, this must be a one player game. How retro. Although depending on the level you play, you can play as either Scooby or Shaggy. There's a hub world where you can select which level you want to play, although you do have to play them in order, and then each of these levels is split into three separate 
levels. So I guess it's more appropriate to say that there's a number of areas and then each area is split into three levels. The basic gist of it is it's a corridor platformer. Think Crash Bandicoot, but without the polish. You run from point A to point B whilst avoiding the basic obstacles and enemies that get in your way and collecting items that are on the floor. The first couple of levels are not the best representation of the game as a whole. They're extremely simple compared to how the game gets later on, so they make it feel almost too easy and a little bit dull. But even worse, you're interrupted literally every five seconds by a video call telling you what to do. I know you're hungry, Scooby, but these pies aren't for eating. You'll want to throw them at enemies when they- Now I get, with video games in general, you have to have some kind of tutorial, some kind of guide explaining how they work, and especially with games that are potentially aimed at kids and therefore could be one of the first games they ever play, you need to lay everything out exactly as it is, and not just assume everyone already knows. But that doesn't stop this from being annoying. Sometimes you barely get a chance to process what it just told you before it's telling you something else. So we're lucky it is actually a basic game. The individual Scooby snacks you find on the floor are your basic platforming pickup. Collect 100, you get an extra life, or chance as they call it in this game. Although something fairly unique is you get bonus Scooby snacks for collecting multiple in a row within a short space of time. Collecting the hamburgers you find will restore life, and the pies you collect are basically ammunition. You use them to throw at enemies as a main form of attack. Although for some reason it makes the same crunching eating sound when you collect the pies as when you collect the other food-based pickups. Which doesn't make sense because you're throwing the pies, so surely you should just collect them and not eat them. At the end of each level there's a box of Scooby Snacks which you touch to complete the level, which from what I've read comes directly from the film, so I can't really complain there. They're at least being loyal to the source material. Your obstacles are also typical things you find in this genre of game. Platforms, pitfalls, and dangerous damaging things like spikes. Everything you'd expect. The enemies in the game are actually really varied and really cool looking. It's just unfortunate that they're extremely weak. Now I didn't complete the game, but from my time playing, Every enemy dies to one pie, and the pies have a fairly long range, so the enemies never get a chance to actually show off their unique movesets that make them supposedly dangerous. You just throw the pie, and they're gone, and then you don't have to worry anymore. The only real risk is running out of pies, but in that case, most enemies are pretty slow as well, so you can just walk right past them and it doesn't matter. They're very easy to dodge. Now every third level is a boss stage. These are okay and probably the most interesting stages in the game, but a prompt comes up on screen telling you exactly when to attack the boss, kind of defeating the purpose of trying to figure out the pattern and figuring out when they're weak and open to attack. So you just stay out of the way until you see the prompt come up and then go and attack. The controls are okay, but there's no analog support, which is a shame. Considering it's 2001, it's still all on the D-pad, which can make it a little less precise than you might want it to be at times, but considering the levels are so linear, you don't need camera control, so it's not a major issue. <laughs> and when it comes to playing as Scooby and Shaggy, they're effectively the same. The levels do get more complex as the game goes on, but you can get through a lot of it by just ignoring 90% of what's going on around you. If you focus on just moving forwards and staying on flat land, you'll be absolutely fine. Beyond the first cutscene, it doesn't feel too much like Scooby-Doo at all, really. It's a fairly basic platformer, it doesn't really do anything special, and just takes ideas straight from Crash Bandicoot, but just ends up making you want to play Crash Bandicoot. There's no mystery solving, a lot of the typical Scooby-Doo tropes just aren't here. It's an okay, average, fairly underwhelming platforming title, with a Scooby-Doo skin stuck on top of it. Yeah! Alright, man! Wow, Shaggy, you did it! Well, it's a start. It's not what I wanted, but to be honest, it is kind of what I was expecting, especially for the first Scooby-Doo game on a PlayStation system. So that's the standard we've got to go off. Now we're going to move on to all of the PS2 games with the one PSP game that sort of comes somewhere in the middle. Most of these were published by THQ, 
until later on when suddenly they start getting published straight up by Warner Brothers games. But anyhow, let's start going through all of these PS2 games that are related to Scooby-Doo. So we move forward a year and a whole generation. Now on the PlayStation 2 we've got Scooby-Doo Night of a Hundred Frights. So no longer based on any individual Scooby-Doo story or movie, this one seems to pride itself on including a lot of content from the original series. So in my opinion that's a pretty good start, that's the kind of thing I'm looking for. The way you shake and shiver, you know we got a mystery to solve Scooby-Doo be ready for your act. Once again we got a good faithful intro, and once again everyone looks and sounds the part. Presentation gets an A+, and we even get a laugh track. Right, you two. Don't forget the real reason we're here. Go lobster bisque! No, silly. So far it does genuinely feel like the original series of Scooby-Doo. My friend Holly says there's strange goings on up here at her family home, Mystic Manor. <laughs> and she could really use our help. Look, there she is now! Now we just play as Scooby-Doo. Most of the Scooby gang have been kidnapped by evil bad guy. The primary aim of the game is to explore in and around Mystic Manor to try and rescue the rest of the Scooby gang and figure out and solve the mystery. You collect Scooby snacks, which kind of act like a currency, and keys, and together these unlock new areas of the map, as well as items, and even abilities for Scooby-Doo to use, which gives it a almost Metroidvania kind of feel. You've got one big map and you need to unlock certain items and abilities in order to get to certain areas that you have to backtrack to. There's save points and warp zones littered across the area, or warp gates I should say, that let you save your game and teleport to different areas of the map. It's a pretty cool idea and does make it feel like one big story is unfolding. Here, take this map. It'll help you get around a little easier. Get around a little easier? Look at this thing, I don't know what the hell I'm looking at. This is the biggest mystery to solve in the whole game. I found it easier to just ignore it. The gameplay is fairly basic, and I suppose when it comes to a game based on a cartoon, you're not going to expect things to be too complicated. You jump across platforms, you avoid traps, avoid enemies, use items and abilities when necessary. It all functions pretty well, I don't have any major complaints except for one, which is the right analogue stick does absolutely nothing. You get no camera control in this 3D platforming adventure. Though to be fair, there weren't really any moments where I was desperate for it. The automated camera generally does a pretty good job, but if anything it would be nice to have the option just to have a look at the details of the levels a little better. Especially with the environments being very faithful to the original cartoon. This time the whole game you play as Scooby-Doo, with Shaggy joining in occasionally to help out and solve puzzles and that kind of thing. Raggy. Hey, Am I happy to the only thing the game really lacks is that kind of mystery solving element. It plays out like one big episode, but a more action filled episode as opposed to a whodunit solve the mystery kind of episode. It's a fun platformer with some good adventure elements in there, and aesthetically very pleasing for a Scooby Doo fan. Overall, this sets a pretty good standard. We've played two Scooby-Doo games so far, and neither one of them have been terrible. Night of a Hundred Frights gets a thumbs up from me. I just wish there was a bit more problem solving to make it feel like the complete package. Next up comes Scooby-Doo Mystery Mayhem. This came out in 2004, also on the PlayStation 2, and once again published by THQ. And until I mention otherwise, just assume they're all published by THQ. Where are you? We got... Once again, a solid intro. Great looking character models too, the best we've seen so far. This time, instead of one big area and one big story, 
we're split into separate episodes. Five levels, basically. On the junior detective handbook. But that was in the fourth grade. <clears throat> we'll solve this matter later, Miss Dinkley. Now, it seems Cutscenes are once again good. So far, this seems to be a standard thing. We've got good voice acting, recognisable characters. It feels like a Scooby-Doo episode. There is this weird thing in the cutscenes where all the character models look like they have this bright light shining on them. But it's a minor complaint. Once again, presentation, really good. You now play as both Scooby and Shaggy at the same time. You press a button to tag in the other character, so you swap between them whenever you want, with the other one following along. My first impression when playing the game was, it's the most awkward to control so far. It's a bit of a shame when they've already nailed the controls fairly well before, at least a lot better than this. The problem here is, instead of feeling like I'm playing as Scooby or Shaggy, I feel like I'm driving them. You have this really wide turning circle, and you can't really effectively turn on the spot. This makes precise movements frustrating, and as you can see, picking up a nearby object is way more difficult than it ever needed to be. This one is not really a platformer. Actually, it's not a platformer at all. There's no jump button, although sometimes you can climb up and down objects. You just use the X button to interact with things and solve some basic puzzles. Now you do look for clues to bring back to Velma in each stage, but they essentially just act as a pickup or collectible, so it's not like you're actually searching for clues, it's just, oh, there's one on the floor, I'll go touch it, that's it, there's not much more to it. The gameplay mostly revolves around the mechanic of the Tome of Doom. <laughs> You find it pretty early on, and it's what you use to attack and capture monsters in the game. It's pretty much a second-rate version of Luigi's Mansion. Actually, the more I think of it, it is just Luigi's Mansion, but with considerably worse controls and a more bland level design. I still prefer Night of a Hundred Frights because Mystery Mayhem is just too awkward to play and that meant I didn't spend nearly as much time playing this as the previous ones so far. I got too annoyed too quickly and when it feels like you've already played a very similar, almost outright the same game before in Luigi's Mansion, but considerably better, that just makes the whole experience worse. It feels like you're playing a ripoff. They've started to put some mystery solving mechanics in here with the whole collecting clues, but they just feel like meaningless objects in the end. Jump forward a year to 2005, and now, once again on PlayStation 2, we have Scooby Doo Unmasked. Still got the classic intro, looking better than ever. This is like the one thing in each game that is consistently good every time. That along with the setup and cutscenes. I can't wait to meet him. Like, what does Jed do, Fred? He makes monsters. Monsters? You know what? <laughs> I just remembered I've got something on the stove. And me and Scoob have to go back. Relaxy, cat. Now Fred's cousin Jed is missing with his monster movie effects studio trashed. So it's time for Scooby-Doo and the gang to discover what happened. A good Scooby-Doo-esque setup, so I can't complain there. Thankfully, it's not just another Luigi's Mansion ripoff, and we're back to a more traditional platformer with much better controls. Scooby-Doo is now the only playable character again, and he has a ton of different moves. Not only can he jump, but he can spin like Crash Bandicoot now. The game is also complete with crates, just like Crash Bandicoot, to smash through and get stuff. There's a running slide attack, a rolling attack, and then there's a whole bunch of other attacks in there as well. When you wear costumes, you can find and unlock in the game. If anything, it's a little bit overkill. It doesn't feel like this game really justifies such a massive moveset, but I suppose it's better than having not enough. There's even masses of collectibles. Scooby Snacks are here as per usual, and this time they're restoring health. You collect 100 and you get an extra Scooby medal, which acts like a... like a heart does in a Zelda game. You can also collect clues, which are just pickups again, no investigating going on. And you bring them to Velma to unlock new areas or activate some mechanism. Great! You found a clue. 
It's some sort of key card. So they're more like a key in a traditional game as opposed to a clue in a Scooby-Doo cartoon. Coins you find unlock and upgrade costumes and you can find food all about which you can bring to Shaggy who will increase the number of Scooby medals you have, in other words your health, once you've given him enough food to complete a recipe. You can then also find pieces of traps which unlock information on different monsters in this monster profile section. If that didn't sound like enough, there's also Mubba. Mubba is supposed to be a crafting material to craft costumes, but it works more like a currency. It's not like there's different varieties of Mubba. I think the different colours just give you a different amount of Mubba. I'm saying the word Mubba far too often now, so I'm gonna try and avoid it. But like I said, it's just another form of currency in this game. Call it Mubber. A remarkable soy-based formula that can take any shape. And it only breaks down under UV light. Isn't that right, Mars? The levels are designed in a semi-open form. Each level has a sort of central hub which split off into multiple different areas, which all play out as pretty basic, linear, fairly uninspired platforming levels. You got all this stuff going on, all these collectibles, all this moveset, and yet it still boils down to get from point A to point B, primarily by jumping around. But the game doesn't really take advantage of all the different systems they've put into it. It feels like it could have been a lot better if instead of putting all these different systems in the game, they just focused on one or two. It doesn't help that the game is also really short. To get a good idea of this, there's a sort of intro tutorial level which takes a good 5 minutes or so, 10 max, and that's 6% of the game complete already. I don't think you necessarily have to go for the full 100% to get to the end credits. How dare you disturb the peace of the great Zendu! Leave, leave while you still have the chance! Scooby-Doo Unmasked had promise, but it's ended up a fairly dull experience. It's just a big melting pot of unfulfilled concepts in a game far too small to actually take advantage of them. Now we move on. The year is 2006 and we've got our first PSP game, Scooby-Doo Who's Watching Who. Mystery Inc. join forces with GSI, Ghost Scene Investigation, who are, from what I can gather, basically the same thing as Mystery Inc., but they're a bunch of jerks. Then stay out of our way so we could do our thing. We don't want your slipshod methods and shenanigans interfering with our serious investigation. Like, what's a shenanigan? I don't know if they're a normal part of the modern cartoon, or they're invented specifically for this game, but like them or not, they're going to be around the whole time. Starting out seems like a pretty typical platformer, similar to a lot of what we've been seeing before. Another one where you just play as Scooby-Doo, once again spinning as your main attack. Although there's also a belly flop which is actually more useful. Now first impressions left me confused. Within 10 seconds there was a near indestructible ghost just hanging around all the friendly characters in the hub area. It just kicks the hell out of me. So I run through this door and I'm driving the mystery machine in some kind of racing combat stage that lasts absolutely forever. The game keeps telling me to ram the opponent, but every time I do it has no effect on the health bar. There's no separate attack button, so I have no idea what to do. The driving itself is pretty awkward, I guess I'd best describe it as kind of floaty but I did eventually manage to figure out what was going on after starting again. Turns out you can only start damaging the enemy until you've been driving around for a good 10 minutes. It makes no sense and it's just kind of frustrating, but that's how it works and at least I wasn't just stuck here forever. Once I got through all that, I figured out how the game actually works. So each level, of which there's five, you have a hub area. This seems like a pretty typical thing in these games. These hub areas have three separate sub-levels. Now one is always a platforming level, one is always a driving level as we just saw, though not always with the same goal, and one is a chase sequence where you're running towards the camera and away from a bad guy. Most of the time these sub-levels make no sense in the context of the story and the game, and they can last way too long, especially the driving and chase sequences. They get old really quickly 
and they give the game way too much of a chance to show the technical issues, especially in the chase sequences. There's a lot of problems you can encounter there, and a lot of bugs, which luckily didn't break the game or make it too difficult for me, but they were definitely noticeable, and I've heard bad things about other people's experience. Now, in these sub-levels, you do collect clues. Uh, again, you're just walking over an item, in this case a magnifying glass, and there you go, you've got a clue. So, again, no actual investigating going, you don't actually hunt for the clues, but they're there, and as is becoming the norm, you take them to Velma. But this time, you analyse them and connect them to a suspect in order to progress onto accusing a suspect when you have enough clues. So on paper, this is the best attempt at having a mystery-solving investigation element to one of these Scooby-Doo games. And this overall idea is what I've been looking for, but it's executed extremely poorly. Analyzing the clues is just playing through these same three mini-games over and over, which, like the sub-levels, last way too long and don't really make much sense. Analyzing clues is always going to have to involve you pressing buttons at the right time to do the right thing. That's how a video game works. But the problem is the way it's presented. It doesn't look like you're analyzing these clues. These minigames could be for absolutely anything. They're as bland and unimaginative as you could get. Once you've successfully analyzed a clue, the game then outright tells you which suspect the clue points at. Once again, taking away any critical thinking or problem-solving skills that you would hope to be involved with, you know, detective work. So once you've collected enough clues to make an accusation, you play another little minigame. This time timing traps on a monster chasing you, which I guess you could say is a kind of boss fight. But they're dead simple, and once again, just the same thing repeated over and over. Rinse and repeat this for five times over the five levels, and you've got the whole game. Great presentation once again, the best concepts if you just read them on paper, but tedious and poor gameplay make for sadly one of the dullest experiences a Scooby-Doo video game has to offer on a PlayStation system. This wound up being the final Scooby-Doo game THQ published. Now Warner Brothers are straight up publishing them themselves. For these final two games, both developed by Taurus Games, we start in 2009 with Scooby-Doo First Frights. We're now going in a totally different direction. We don't have the kind of old-school Scooby-Doo look. Instead, we've got a now more modern-for-the-time cartoon style, which ironically has now dated it more so as a late 2000s kids game than the 60s cartoon aesthetic ever did. Sorry, Velma. Like we haven't eaten since the snack after lunchtime snack. Shaggy, Scooby, you guys are going to love me! The Keystone Castle... We no longer have any classic intro. A lot of what made the previous games feel kind of Scooby-Dooey. While the laugh track and classic voices are there, they feel out of place because the characters are just somewhat off all the time. And in general, it just feels like this could have been anything, but Scooby-Doo was tacked on. we can go eat our way to ours. Yeah, see what I mean? This game is split into four episodes, which are split into levels that go through in order. And it looks like they finally just straight up said to hell with adding any kind of investigation or mystery solving, stealth elements, all the stuff you see in the classic show is no longer part of the gameplay. What does a new Scooby-Doo game involve? Beating the ever-loving crap out of everything you see. Whether it moves or not, whether it's an enemy or just an innocent park bench, you beat the crap out of it with your string of sausages. 
everything around you will explode into an absurd number of Scooby Snacks. And there's a specific reason for this, and that is because it's a complete rip-off of the LEGO games. Thing is, in the LEGO games, it makes sense that you can destroy everything and get a bunch of Lego pieces, because it's all made of Lego. What I get from this is in the Scooby-Doo universe, everything's made of Scooby Snacks, which just makes Scooby and Shaggy look even more stupid for accepting one or two as a bribe, when they could just punch a lamppost and get like 30 of them. Just like Lego, you can switch between the characters, where for the first time, you can play as all the main guys, and all have their own unique abilities to help solve basic environmental puzzles. All logic is sadly out of the window because none of these abilities have anything to do with the characters. If I mention Shaggy, what's the first thing you think of? Obviously, it's his trusty grappling hook. Velma loves books, so she just launches books at everything indiscriminately. She's an unstoppable, overpowered monster. But I suppose it's the one ability that makes the most sense because she likes books. Even then, we're reaching. The most confusing is Daphne's super special ability. She can climb poles. I'm not even making this up. This is what makes Daphne an asset to Mystery Incorporated. Everything plays out like a second-rate or third-rate LEGO game. Unlocking more costumes and versions of characters for new abilities. You can get the free roam mode where you can unlock more stuff. Other players can jump in with co-op, which is the first time we've seen that, but I can't see much of a reason why two people would want to play this game. It's just completely without the polish, stripped down, and has very little to do with Scooby-Doo. When there's so many LEGO games you can play, and so many other Scooby-Doo games you can play, this goes way down on the list. There's no point in looking at it. Whatever you're looking for, it's been done better. <laughs> So Scooby-Doo in the Spooky Swamp came along a year later in 2010, and it's a complete follow-up to the previous title. You could say it's a kind of sequel to First Frights, and it's another Lego ripoff. But this is admittedly quite a bit better than the previous effort. General gameplay still works much the same as last time, else it wouldn't be a Lego ripoff. But it is expanded upon, and the level design is a bit more acceptable. They've tried to add investigating and mystery solving, with a camera and magnifying glass to take pictures of suspects, and also find and log clues. It's a nice addition, which does make it feel a little bit more like Scooby-Doo. There is a ton more costumes you can unlock, but now they're not required for the gameplay. Actually, they don't have any effect on gameplay at all. They don't add new abilities, they aren't needed to complete anything in the game, they are just extra costumes, purely cosmetic. It may sound like a downgrade, but it's actually kind of welcome. This game is too short and simple to justify backtracking and extra abilities. It makes more sense keeping things more basic. There's now a character wheel, so you can play any character at any time. In the previous game, it was only two characters at once. Now, you can switch between them whenever you want. Again, similar to how the LEGO games progressed. The biggest problem this game has is the length. I mentioned it's short, well, it's incredibly short. There are only a few levels, and they're not particularly long. The game can be completed 100% in a few hours at most. And to be fair, there's not even much of a reason to try and collect everything and get to 100%. There's not really a lot going on. There's only like three or four types of enemy in the whole game, along with a minimal number of collectibles that have very little purpose. When you're basing it on the LEGO games, which have a lot of collectibles and lots of things to go for and unlock, half the purpose of this gameplay style is lost. 
Now, reviews of this game would lead you to believe it's one of, if not the best Scooby-Doo game ever made. Gameplay-wise, it may show the most promise, but overall, it's a pretty boring experience that's criminally short. It feels more like an extended demo than a full game that just makes you wish they actually made a LEGO Scooby-Doo. Maybe the Nintendo Wii version is better somehow. The PS2 version is actually kind of ignored. Coming out in 2010, it was right in the middle of the PS3's life cycle, and the game seems like it was primarily developed with a Nintendo Wii in mind. It's not a great game, it's okay, there's actually a decent game trapped in here somewhere, but that decent game is called Lego whatever. Scooby-Doo doesn't have to be involved in this whatsoever, it doesn't change anything. Easy peasy lemon squeezy! <laughs> Wrong colour, dude! So what we've got on the end here are seven games which kind of nail the presentation of Scooby-Doo. Most of these get the classic look, the characters, the voice acting, the kind of storyline and what you'd expect to happen in that regards, all perfect. But then when it comes to the gameplay, it's almost entirely third-person platformers or basic action games. There's very little in the way of solving a mystery and you only really get kind of half of what Scooby-Doo is about. So if we try and narrow it down now, we've got the first game which we can kind of ignore. It's an okay PlayStation 1 platformer that kind of rips off Crash Bandicoot, but there's not much of a point in playing it because it's not going to scratch any particular nostalgia itch for Scooby-Doo, it doesn't have much to do with it, and there's an absolute ton of better platforming options on the PlayStation 1 and that whole generation of systems, so you don't ever have to play that. And also I can immediately kind of say just don't bother with the two LEGO game ripoffs, the ones that came along after THQ lost the publishing rights. The gameplay with these, technically speaking, works pretty good, but they're extremely short, very easy, lack a lot of content, and are probably the ones furthest away from Scooby-Doo in terms of the presentation. Out of what's left, these all have their merits, but the one I would go for is still Night of a Hundred Frights, which was the first one released on the PlayStation 2. Although this is still quite far from what I wanted in terms of gameplay, that's something all of these are guilty of. This one nails the feeling of the classic Scooby-Doo show the best, and it has all the nostalgia since it kind of has almost all of the Scooby-Doo villains from the um, original season. If you're going into this as a Scooby-Doo fan, this one's probably going to leave you the most satisfied.